नमस्कार अ वॉम वेलकम टू वर्ल्ड न्यूज एन इंडियन पर्सपेक्टिव ऑन आकाशवाणी दिस इज रेशमा तिवारी ब्रिंगिंग ग्लिम्स ऑफ द मेजर डेवलपमेंट्स ऑफ द डे फ्रॉम अक्रॉस द ग्लोब ओवर द नेक्स्ट हाफ एन आवर वी शैल ब्रिंग टू यू द लेटेस्ट फ्रॉम द वर्ल्ड ऑफ पॉलिटिक्स इकोनॉमी स्पोर्ट्स एंटरटेनमेंट एंड मोर द हेडलाइंस इंडियाज प्राइम मिनिस्टर नरेंद्र मोदी आस्क गवर्नमेंट सर्वेंस टू बिक इंक्रीज पीपल्स फेस इन द सिस्टम Three day G20 development ministers meeting begins in Varanasi. New Delhi says its efforts proved instrumental in Canada's decision to halt deportation of some Indian students. India beat four time champion South Korea 2-1 to lift Women's Junior Hockey Asia Cup in Japan. In tennis, Novak Djokovic clinches record 23rd Grand Slam after third French Open men's singles title. And in cricket, Australia win ICC World Test Championship final, defeating India by 209 runs at Oval in England. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi has said that it is the responsibility of all government servants to increase faith of people in the government system. Speaking after inaugurating the first ever national training conclave at the International Exhibition and Convention Center in New Delhi, Mr. Modi emphasized that the government has never lacked talented, dedicated and committed officials. He said, "Just like the army's impeccable credibility in the eyes of public, all government servants should try to further increase the faith of people in the government system." The prime minister highlighted the importance of service orientation of government work, ownership in realizing the aspirations of common man, need to break hierarchy and using experience of every person in the organization, jan bhagidari, the zeal to improve and innovate the system among other things. He added that the training modules should be oriented and developed in a way that these aspects are inculcated in the government officials. Mr Modi also said that the old approach where posting in the training institutions was seen as punishment posting is changing. The prime minister also discussed the vertical and horizontal silos and the shackles of hierarchy exhorting officials to overcome them to seek out those with experience regardless of hierarchy. He credited the success of Swachh Bharat Mission, Aspirational Districts Program, Amrit Sarovar and the substantial share of India in digital payments in the world to Jan Bhagidhari. The conclave aimed at strengthening the training infrastructure for civil servants across the country was hosted by the Capacity Building Commission. Over 1500 representatives from various training institutes including central, state, regional and zonal training institutes and research institutes attended the conclave. Civil servants from the central government departments, state governments and local governments as well as experts from the private sector took part in the deliberations. Earlier in a tweet Mr Modi said the national training conclave is a part of government's efforts to learn and serve better. He also highlighted the importance of capacity building, ending silos and enhancing service and said the government will keep transforming challenges into opportunities for a new India. Prime Minister Narendra Modi has said he is proud to serve a nation that is marching forward with an undeterred resolve. In a tweet with the hashtag Nine Years of India First, Mr. Modi said that from multilateral platforms to Atmanirbhar Bharat to Make in India, every stride is a testament to the strength and spirit of Indian people. Mr. Modi's remarks come amidst BJP organizing various programs across the country as part of a mega public outreach. to mark 9 years of the modi government the prime minister shared a write up on his government following a nation first approach and prioritizing national security he also shared articles on my gov highlighting his government's nation first foreign policy the g20 development ministers meeting began in varanasi city of uttar pradesh on sunday external affairs minister dr s j shankar is chairing the meeting which will continue till 13th june Dr Jay Shankar met with EU Commissioner for International Partnerships, Secretary General of United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, German Minister for Economic Cooperation and Development and Australian Development Minister among other dignitaries on Sunday. Around 200 delegates are taking part in the summit. More from our correspondent. 
Just after their arrival at Kashi, the delegates went to see the famous Ganga Arati on river cruise. There are arrangements of cultural night for the entertainment of delegates to show them a glimpse of the spiritual and religious importance of the holy city. The delegates will also be taken to Sarna. The whole Varanasi city is decked up for the event and administration has changed the whole picture of the city by decorating it with beautiful gardens, sculptures and lighting as well as ornamental towers increasing its beauty manifold. Sushil Chandra Tiwari, Akashwani News, Varanasi. In today's hotspot section, we bring you a discussion on G20 Development Ministers Meeting. In conversation are Ashok Sajanhar, former diplomat, and S. Rangabhashyam, Akashwani correspondent. The G20 Development uh, Ministers Meeting is uh, underway in Varanasi, which is basically a three-day event from the 11th to the 13th of uh, June. And in this particular meeting, lots of things uh, will be discussed uh, which would be relevant to all the member countries of the G20 and not only the member countries but the entire humanity to discuss uh, the issues and the entire gamut of issues related to this particular meeting we have with us uh, ambassador ashok sajjanhar mr sajjanhar a warm welcome to the program thank you very much sir mr sajjanhar uh, to put things in perspective tell us about uh, the main agenda and the main points which will be discussed in this particular meeting of the G20 development ministers there was a meeting of the development working group uh, that took place recently earlier this month in New Delhi and uh, the issues that were discussed in that meeting are also going to be taken up here. Uh, if I could make one point and you said uh, that very correctly that of course the discussions and the decisions that emanate from uh, the meetings of the G20, they will not be relevant only for these limited number of countries, 20 countries, but basically their maximum impact, their major impact will be on about 180 countries, most of them developing ones who are not really represented at the negotiating table when the G20 members meet. To come to this uh, development ministers meeting that taking place in Varanasi, I think there are two particular aspects that have been identified, that have been flagged, which are going to be discussed in great detail. One is the issue of uh, reform of multilateralism. We have seen that, uh, unfortunately, mul multilateral institutions have not been able to equip themselves very creditably in uh, uh, recent times. Basically, because these institutions were, whether it is the United Nations, the UN Security Council, it is the WTO, it is the World Bank, it is the World Health Organization, all these institutions were created in the aftermath of the Second World War. So they represent the reality of the situation that has existed at that time. Of course, after 75 years, 78 years, the situation in the world is very, very different. For instance, uh, India was, as an economic power, a non-entity when uh, the uh, United Nations was established in 1945 or when India became independent in 1947. But today it has emerged as a big economy, $3.5 trillion, fifth largest economy, fastest growing economy, slated to become the third largest economy by the end of this decade. So there are many changes that have taken place and of course the world needs to come to terms with the reality as it exists today. So one issue is reform of uh, the multilateral institutions and how can that be done so that uh, global governance can be made more effective. And the second one is to deal with the, the issue of climate change which has really become an existential threat as far as the world is concerned. Of course, we need to keep in mind that all the environmental pollution and uh, that we see around, whether it is in air, whether it is on water, whether it is on land, this is a contribution of the developed countries because the developed countries in their process of development have polluted uh, the air, the lakes, uh, the seas uh, and uh, the rivers. And uh, But now it is, uh, as it is called, it's a common but differentiated responsibility. So all the countries are meeting, they will discuss all these issues. 
and one initiative that is going to come up for particular discussion and tension and focus is what is known as mission life life uh, l i s e which stands for lifestyle for environment this was an initiative that was launched by honorable prime minister narendra modi when he participated in the cop 26 cop uh, stands for the conference of the parties under one of the un agencies dealing with united nations environment program so the 26th meeting of all these countries took place in glasgow in the united kingdom in uh, november 2021 and that is where prime minister modi had launched this idea of life and the thought behind uh, mission life is that all individuals communities societies countries they need to take this uh, issue up uh, personally become uh, real time stakeholders and change their lifestyle so that they are able to go on for a more sustainable way yeah. of living so that it doesn't have an adverse impact as far as the global climate is concerned ambassador sajjan har uh, you made a mention about climate change Uh, its impact and also the thought of you know reducing our carbon footprint across the world i'm sure you'll agree that you know the main bone of contention uh, between developed countries and developing countries that developing countries are arguing that in your time you grew by leaps and bounds uh, without thinking about carbon footprint but now when the chance has come for developing countries to grow in leaps and bounds uh, using industrial revolution now you are saying that we also need to bring down our carbon footprint so when will we grow how will we develop if if all these restrictions are imposed on us so that is a valid point and that is also a, a stumbling block uh, which needs to be clarified isn't it no you are very right and that is why you know this at the kyoto protocol in the late 1990s uh, this whole idea of what is known as a cbdr common but differentiated responsibility that the whole world has to assume responsibility but obviously it is differentiated because as you said very rightly as the arguments that are being made by developing countries they are absolutely right that during this their own process of development currently developed countries they have uh, really polluted the atmosphere they are the ones who have created uh, this climate change the global warming has been done by them so morally they cannot tell developing countries that they should not to go that path but of course now there are possibilities of going in for uh, renewables and uh, whether it is the solar energy and in that context uh, india launched the initiative of what is known as the international solar alliance at the uh, cop 21 that took place in paris in 2015 and uh, today there are more than 100 countries which are uh, members of uh, the international solar alliance and the idea is that uh, the solar energy is coming to us uh, free of charge and if we can harness it and if we can store it then it can be used in place of fossil fuels but of course uh, the uh, challenge is huge uh, you we need new technology in terms of storing it and of course infrastructure putting in place the infrastructure for uh, the solar uh, energy for harnessing solar energy that also is an expensive proposition although now we have seen that uh, solar energy the manufacture of solar energy uh, the costing has come down it is uh, below the energy that is created uh, through oil through crude oil uh, also at times uh, through gas but maybe not as competitive as far as uh, coal is concerned so yes uh, that is a challenge and uh, it was decided also at the cop 21 in paris that the developed countries would provide finance of 100 billion dollars every year to developing countries so that they are able to put in uh, the right kinds of technologies so that uh, the uh, environmental pollution is arrested it doesn't take place yeah also it was agreed that uh, the developed countries would provide uh, technology at concessional rates to developing countries unfortunately none of these uh, has been uh, 
uh, observed by developed countries and uh, some of the reasons we can uh, speak about, we can think about that the last three, four years have been particularly difficult for the global economy and even for developed countries. We have seen whether it is the COVID-19 pandemic that has Im- adversely impacted the economies yeah. of all countries, including developed countries, and also now the uh, Russia-Ukraine war that has also had a very deleterious impact on the economies of uh, all countries. So they have not been able to provide this funding uh, and financing. But of course, it needs to be done if developing countries are to pursue the path of uh, green energy and renewable energy. Ambassador Ashok Sajjanhar, it's been a pleasure having you in this program. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ranga. The Comptroller and Auditor General of India, CAG, is hosting a three-day SAI20 summit under India's G20 presidency in Goa from Monday. Supreme Audit Institutions, SAI20, is the engagement group of audit organizations belonging to the G20 countries. CAG Girish Chandra Murmu will deliver the inaugural address at the SAI20 summit on Monday. The three-day summit will conclude on Wednesday. Supreme Audit Institutions of Australia, Brazil, Indonesia, South Korea, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Bangladesh, Egypt, Mauritius, Nigeria, Oman, Spain, UAE, Morocco and Poland will participate in the summit. Besides, delegates from invitee countries and international organizations will also attend the event. Our correspondent reports that the SAI 20 engagement group's two priority areas are blue economy and responsible artificial intelligence. During the SAI 20 summit, the Comptroller and Auditor General of India, CAG, is expected to present a summary on blue economy and responsible artificial intelligence, AI. Blue economy is the sustainable use of oceanic resources for economic growth, improved livelihoods and jobs while preserving the health of the ecosystem. With the AI making greater inroads into governance, adopting it into audit techniques can increase their effectiveness. The SAI 20 summit Summit will offer a platform for sharing of knowledge and experiences by eminent panelists during the insights on blue economy and responsible AI. According to the CAG, consensus will be derived on the future role and responsibilities of SAI20 engagement group in fostering accountability in governance and partnering with governments to respond to global challenges. Zakir Nazir, Akashwani News, Panaji, Goa. A three-day G20 Digital Economy Working Group Conference will be organized in Pune from Monday on digital security. The Secretary of the Union Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, Alkesh Kumar Sharma, informed the official media in Pune that three major issues of digital public infrastructure, security in digital public economy, and digital skills will be discussed in this meeting. The conference of G20 countries will be inaugurated by Minister of State for Electronic and Information Technology, Rajiv Chandrasekhar. This is Akashwani giving you the world news. The Indian government's consistent efforts have been instrumental in the Canadian government's decision to halt the deportation of some Indian students in Canada. India has been taking up the matter of these Indian students who were threatened with deportation for allegedly submitting fraudulent admission letters to Canadian authorities. Sources said the actual number of students is much less than the 700 being reported in the media. They said most of these students had gone to Canada during 2017 to 2019 and some of them obtained work permits after completing their studies. Sources said External Affairs Minister Dr. S. J. Shankar took up the matter with his Canadian counterpart. Secretary East Saurabh Kumar also raised it during his visit to Canada in April this year. Indian Consulate in Toronto where most of the students are based, have met many of them. Sources added that Canadian authorities were repeatedly urged to be fair and take a humanitarian approach since the students were not at fault. It was also pointed out that there were gaps in the Canadian system and a lack of diligence owing to which the students were granted visas and also allowed to enter Canada. Since then, Canadian parliamentarians across political parties have spoken in support of the students. 
Immigration Minister Sean Frazier has indicated that Canada is actively pursuing a solution for international students who are facing uncertainty. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has acknowledged the need for fair treatment of students. Some students have recently received stay orders on their deportation notices. Sixteen Indian crew members of cargo vessel oil tanker Empty Heroic Edon, who were in detention for over nine months in Equatorial Guinea and Nigeria, have returned to India after government's negotiations with Nigerian authorities. Official sources said that two 26 crew members of the cargo vessel, including 16 Indians, were in detention since August last year. They were detained in Equatorial Guinea and later in Nigeria and were accused of various crimes including oil theft. Sources said after lengthy negotiations, all charges against the crew were dropped and the ship was released on 27th of last month after paying the fines. Indian mission officials remained in regular touch with the crew and undertook consular access on numerous occasions. Government of India, through its missions in Equatorial Guinea and Nigeria and in bilateral meetings, took up the matter with the foreign authorities at various levels. The sources said they were pressed for early resolution of the issue and repatriation of the Indian crew members. The 53rd Director General Level Border Coordination Conference between India's Border Security Force BSF and Border Guard of Bangladesh BGB got underway in Delhi on Sunday. During the four-day conference, BSF Delegation of India, led by Director General BSF Dr. Sujoy Lal Thalsen, will meet BGB delegation headed by Major General AKM Nazmul Hassan. The conference is being organized to discuss the border-related issues and better coordination between both border guarding forces. During the course of conference, discussions will also be held on how to jointly curb the various trans-border crimes and timely sharing of information between both the border guarding forces. There will also be deliberation on developmental and infrastructural works, joint efforts for effective implementation of coordinated border management plan and confidence building measures. The last BSF BGB coordination conference was held at Dhaka in 2022. At least 25 people were killed and more than 140 injured as heavy rain and thunderstorms hit several parts of Pakistan's Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and Punjab on Saturday. As per the Provincial Disaster Management Authority, people were killed in rain-related incidents in KP's Bannu, Dera Ismail Khan, Karak and Lucky Marwat. It added that at least 69 houses were partially damaged by the rain. Several flights were diverted and delayed in Islamabad and Lahore due to bad weather. The extremely severe cyclonic storm Bipajoy over East Central Arabian Sea moved nearly north northeastwards with a speed of 10 kilometers per hour. It is very likely to move nearly northwards till Wednesday morning. Sea conditions are likely to be rough to very rough till Wednesday evening and high to phenomenal thereafter till Thursday noon along and off Saurashtra and Kutch coasts. India Med Department, IMD, has urged for total suspension of fishing operations over East Central, adjoining West Central and Northeast Arabian Sea till Thursday. Those out at sea are advised to return to coast. Storm surge of about 2 to 3 meters above the astronomical tide is likely to inundate the low-lying areas of Kutch, Dwarka, Porbandar, Jamnagar and Morbi districts during the time of landfall. Damage is expected over Kutch, Dwarka, Porbandar, Jamnagar, Morbi, Junagar and Rajkot districts of Gujarat on Thursday. India defeated four-time champions South Korea 2-1 to win their first Women's Junior Hockey Asia Cup in Kakami Gahara, Japan on Sunday. After a scoreless first quarter, India got things moving with Anu's penalty corner goal in the 22nd minute. South Korea equalized three minutes later with Park Seo Yoon scoring. In the 41st minute, however, Neelam shot strongly to the bottom right of the South Korean custodian to make it 2-1. To secure the deal, the Indian defense held on to a slim lead in the third quarter. 
In tennis, Novak Djokovic created history by becoming the first man to reach the coveted 23 Grand Slam title mark with his straight sets win over Kasper Ruud in the men's singles final of the French Open 2023 in Paris, France on Sunday. This was the Serbs' third title on Parisian clay as he goes past rival Rafael Nadal as the man with the most number of major honours in the history of the game. The world number three ranked Serb breezed past his opponent 7-6-6-3-7-5 to claim his third French Open title and 23rd Grand Slam title overall. In women's singles, Poland's Iga Swiatek became the first woman since 2007 to win back-to-back -back French Open titles when she won her third championship on Saturday, beating Czech Republic's Karolina Muchova 6-2-5-7-6-4 in a thrilling final. The 22-year-old Schwantek is just the third woman in the Open era to win each of her first four Grand Slam finals, the pole adding to her 200, 2020 and 2022 titles in Paris and last year's U.S. Open triumph. Monica Selesh and Naomi Osaka are the only other players to accomplish the feat. Schwantek, the world number one, is also the youngest woman to claim back-to-back -back French Open titles since Monica Selesh in the early 1990s. In cricket, Australia defeated India by 209 runs in the World Test Championship final at Oval in England on Sunday. Chasing a target of 444 runs, Indian batting folded up at a modest total of 234 runs after resuming their innings on day 5 of the match at 164 for 3. India started the final day with 280 runs to win and seven wickets in hand. However, Virat Kohli fell early on 49, adding just five runs to his overnight score before Australia ran through the middle and lower order within the first session. Nathan Lyon took four wickets for 41 runs to wind up the Indian innings. This was India's second defeat in successive WTC finals after losing to New Zealand in 2021 in the inaugural edition. Now let's take a look at the major developments around the world as reported in the foreign press. The Wall Street Journal reports, White House says China has had Cuba spy base since at least 2019. South China Morning Post writes, U.S.-China trade war is distracting the world from globalization's many obvious benefits. The Financial Times reports, U.S. expected to begin unloading oil from seized Iranian tanker. The Japan Times reports Zelensky confirms Ukraine counter-offensive against Russia has begun. The Guardian writes Amazon plane crash, children reunited with family after 40 days in jungle. The Globe and Mail writes ex-Scottish leader Nicola Sturgeon arrested by police investigating governing parties' finances. The Business Recorder writes Iran's Khamenei urges cooperation with UN nuclear watchdog. Le Monde reports, Miracle in the Jungle, Colombia celebrates rescue of children lost in Amazon rainforest. And now a quick look at the headlines once again. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi asks government servants to increase people's faith in the system. Three-day G20 development ministers meeting begins in Varanasi. New Delhi says it's efforts proved instrumental in Canada's decision to halt deportation of some Indian students. India beat four-time champion South Korea 2-1 to lift Women's Junior Hockey Asia Cup in Japan. In tennis, Novak Djokovic clinches record 23rd Grand Slam after third French Open men's singles title. And in cricket, Australia win ICC World Test Championship final, defeating India by 209 runs at Oval in England. And now before we end, let's listen to Mahatma Gandhi's favorite bhajan, Vaishnav Jan, by artists from Denmark. Vaishnav Jan tu tine kahi yeg, peed up rai jane re. Vaishnav Jan tu tine kahi yeg, peed up rai jane re. पर दुखे उपकार करे तोए मन अभिमान ना आने रे सक 
मन निचल राखे धन धन जन नी रे वैष्णव जन तू तीन कहिए के पीड़ा पर and with that we end this bulletin we'll be back at the same time tomorrow with the next edition of world news